Hi, this is George Kao. Welcome to Our Highest Work, a podcast where we share the best ideas for spiritually based business success and where we are creating an online community of wise and loving mutual support. Great to have you here today. I have a great episode to share with you that I'm personally quite excited about. I think I'll be listening back to this again as well. Uh, in the previous episode, I began to share about this book called Constructive Living, which is one of the, the books that really changed my life when I read it a couple years ago. Um, it set me on a different path and read it just again uh, recently, a couple, about a month ago, and again it had a, a deep impact on me. And I didn't really get to talk much from the book in the past episode. This episode I actually, I, I could, you could see I prepared better and I have um, sections of the book I want to share with you, just, to, just to some, some really uh, interesting sections that um, just in the short time we have that I'll share with you that uh, I think sh for me are, were the most powerful points from the book. So um, I want to begin with a quote and this actually is a quote from the book itself and it sounds so simple but it's very profound. Feelings fade in time unless they are re-stimulated. Feelings fade in time unless they are re-stimulated. And I welcome you to comment on our comments page um, what that quote means for you. If you want to join us for the comments page for this episode, it's ourhighestwork.com slash seven, since this is episode seven. So, what kind of feelings do you want to have? What kind of life do you want to be living? What kind of business would you love to have? And, and what kind of world do you want to live in? The answers to all of these questions, I believe, begins with you. And because your actions lead to your behaviors which lead to either positive or negative feelings continually as a um, sort of as a stable uh, uh, baseline. I mentioned in the previous episode that if you checked in on me any particular moment of the day or any day of the, of the year, you'll probably find me, chances are, you'll find me feeling peaceful or joyful um, you may find me being productive, you may find me recovering, uh, but uh, you'll find me peaceful or joyful, grateful most of the time. And I'll tell you, it was not like this just a couple of years ago. Um, life wasn't always this, um, this good for me. And I think what changed was a lot of the things that were from this book that taught me to pay attention, continually keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back to my behavior and what I can do to service the moment, to be in service of this current moment. And therefore, it changed my habits. And when my, when my behaviors and my habits changed, started to change, my feelings and my, the baseline of my emotional life started to change as well, which is wonderful because as the baseline of my emotional life changed, that also changed, further changed my quote-unquote luck, right? Because as I have more positive emotions, I tend to take more positive actions. I tend to see more positive opportunities that I didn't see before or I wasn't courageous enough to take before. And that further changed my emotions. So it really all begins with you, especially the attention you give to your behavior today. So um, let, before I go into the constructive living content, let me share a marketing tip with you. So this is a segment of the podcast where I either share a marketing business tip or where I share a spiritual tip. So in, in the coming podcast, in just a couple of episodes, we're going to be starting to talk about authentic marketing for a couple of episodes. And when I do that, I'll be sharing this segment will be about spirituality. But right now, I'll share a marketing tip. So last time I talked about the dance of finding your niche, which is... Um, you know, on the one side to uh, reflect on what gives you the most energy and also what seems to give energy to your audience. And on the other side, to be making offers in the world so that you can actually test whether what you've come up with is what the market really 
needs and wants at this time. So sort of a dance between the two. Now, another way for me to say niche finding, finding your calling in terms of your business, is to come up with a topic that you'd be passionate to explore in, in the world, to help the world with, actually. Come up with a topic that you'd be passionate to explore that will be helpful for the world. So do what you love, right? Do what you love. Now, that's one side of, of the dance. The other side of the dance is to go into the world and find out and answer people's questions about your topic. So this is another way of saying what I said last time. Again, on the one side, do what you love. So come up with a topic you're passionate to explore that you think will probably be helpful to the world. And on the other side, go into the world and find out and answer people's questions about that topic. So do what you love on the one side. On the other side, that the world will pay you for, or that at least that the world will be energized by. So, so um, to really understand what the world will pay you for, it really helps to immerse yourself in the thinking and the context of your ideal audience. The group of people that, the type of people, or the group of people, the demographic or the profession or the um, uh, psychographic or what all those terms, the, the type of person, the type of people you would most like to serve, to immerse yourself in their thinking and their life context, to find out what their questions are about your topic. The more you can understand their questions about your topic, the more effective you can be in serving them and the more effective you can be in, in creating a product or service that will, they will actually buy. Okay? So it's about meeting people where they're at. It's about selling what other people actually want. It's about serving other people truly. Okay? And all along the way as you do this, you keep reflecting, as I said, the two sides of reflecting, offering, reflecting, offering. So as you keep figuring out people's questions and answering them, you keep reflecting, what do I most enjoy helping people with? And what, what part of my advice is having the biggest effect? And who is likely to be willing to, they're so interested in certain questions, they'd be willing to pay for it. Okay? And, the, and the resource I'd like to share with you today is my online marketing simplified mind map. I have basically tried to put everything I know about marketing into a single mind map that's publicly free and available. And I will be putting the link to that mind map uh, on this episode page so you can look at that later. Some of you already know where that is, but uh, I'll definitely be putting the link after I record this. So as I go on to talk about constructive living, uh, you will hear many, many ideas. And I invite you to listen for one idea that so resonates with you that you want to apply it this week. Because if you apply one idea from every episode you hear, you will be further along than most people who listen to podcasts. If you apply one idea from every article you read, you will be further along in your progress than most people who read articles. Because most people who read articles, listen to podcasts, watch videos, they have this idea fantasy that they're going to take a lot of ideas and that they will apply it someday. Or that this feeling of consuming content feels like they got something done. But listening, learning is not the same as doing. So listen for one big idea that you're going to apply even today. And you'll be further along in your progress than than, other, than many, many people who learn uh, but don't take action. So that's what I invite you to do. All right. So I want to share with you five concepts that um, from the Constructive Living book that I felt most uh, helpful. Um, and by the way, before I continue, I just want to thank um, Victoria, Vicky, uh, for commenting uh, on, on the live comments thread right here. Thank you, Vicky, for joining me. Uh, really appreciate your presence, and I know there are others who are watching live. Uh, maybe you're commenting in the other comments thread or, or what, but just want to thank you for, for being here. Okay, so five concepts that really stood out to me from the book. Again, this is not a substitute for reading the book. I, I highly recommend you get the book from the library or, or get it uh, online, um, get it from your local bookstore, uh, because reading the book will 
build up the concepts for you in a way that actually feels more impactful for you. But I just want to give you a summary of, of what I learned that was helpful for me and maybe helpful and impactful for you too. So for the first idea was that feelings follow behavior and therefore influence your feelings through purposeful behavior. And I talked about this in depth in the previous episode, episode 6, and you can check that out at ourhighestwork.com slash 6. But I want to share with you some quotes from the book that I didn't get to share last time regarding this concept. So this is from David Reynolds, the book Constructive Living. We need to recognize that feelings are not controllable. If we can't control our feelings, we certainly can't be held responsible for them. And by the way, this means that feelings, they just kind of come up. We can influence them through our behavior and through our habits, but we cannot control feelings just before they come up. Okay? The, the things happen, feelings come up. Okay? So back to the quote. This means that any feeling, seething hatred, erotic urges, grudges, disappointment, timidity, grouchiness, lethargy. Any of these feelings are all right in the sense that you're not morally responsible for feelings. You are not a bad person for having the emotion. You may prefer some feelings to others, but you are not wrong for feeling something, no matter how bad the feeling is, quote, unquote. This is profound. See, we are responsible for our actions, not for our feelings. So we can feel anything we want, but then what do we do with what do we do after that? Regardless of the feelings, in, in spite of the feelings, what do we do after that? That's what we're responsible for. Okay. So another quote from the book: Feelings fade in time unless they are restimulated. Given time, the worst grief, the worst pain, shock, or fright will lose its edge and become little more than a memory. I, I think about, uh, I was walking with my wife the other night. It was at, at night, we were walking, we were crossing the street, and a reckless skateboarder careened down the street, made a turn where we were crossing, and we were, we were just shocked, and he, he purposely like, you know, scared us even as he, as he did that. Careen and I was, I was feeling angry for probably half an hour after that because I, I said, first of all, um, he is uh, he's probably shocking and frightening other people. And second of all, he might get himself hurt. And I said, I actually said to my wife, well, he's setting himself up for a big crash at some point. And she said, she said, um, but his his behavior doesn't affect just him; it affects other people too. His his getting hurt will affect other people too. And I thought that's so right. But guess what? That that just that happened a while ago. I'm not. I'm not even. I haven't even thought about that for for days now, right? It, the feeling has has left. We often forget that, don't we? When we feel something, we think it's gonna it's gonna last forever. No, feelings fade unless they're restimulated. Okay, back to the quote: childbirth, the dentist's drill, the loss of a loved one, the side ache, the rage you felt during that argument, all of them fade unless something happens to stir up those feelings again. And herein lies the hope for the depressed, the embarrassed, the disconsolate. These feelings won't maintain this intensity forever. They too shall pass away. What may seem less gratifying is the observation that this principle applies to the pleasant feelings as well as the unpleasant ones. My joy won't last either, nor will my contentment, nor love, nor peace of mind. These feelings too will fade unless they are re-stimulated. Isn't that wonderful? That's why I, I said that I, I'm going to listen to this episode again myself to remember that. Because when, when you're in the moment of feeling something, it feels like it's going to last forever, right? especially if it's a strong feeling. So again, you can use your behavior to create positive emotions, but it really takes creating habits because, because behavior creates some positivity, but if you don't have the positive behavior habits, the negative behavior, ne negative emotions will still be your baseline of your life, right? So it's about creating uh, habits. But let me move on to the second principle that I felt was particularly powerful from the book. 
The second idea is rather than perseverating, perseverating is a word that means repeating a thought or an action or an utterance long after the stimulus that prompted that thing has ceased. So rather than perseverating on something, we can lose our self-consciousness in the doing of life, in the service to the moment. And I want to read to you a couple of quotes from the book about this. So here's a story that he, he shared with us. Jennifer is nearly 20. Several weeks ago, her boyfriend dumped her for a pert redhead he described as easier and more fun. Jennifer sits on her bed playing music that Jeff used to like, looking at a snapshot of him, replaying in her mind the good times they had together, and just crying her heart out. Jennifer is actively involved in keeping her sorrow going. She is doing things that re-stimulate feelings of loss and injustice. Now, a friend of Jeff's has been waiting in the wings for this opportunity, but when he calls Jennifer, she tells him she doesn't feel like going out right now. Poor Jennifer. Poor, ignorant Jennifer. Her love for Jeff would fade like any other sentiment if only her behavior would give it a chance. End quote. I think about how this is true in every setback in life, isn't it, right? Every setback in life that you have creates these feelings of disappointment, shame, whatever, okay? And then you can wallow in that, perseverate in, in those emotions, or you can realize that life is waiting on the wings for another opportunity for you. Just in the story, Jeff was waiting to, to, to give her another opportunity, uh, or uh, sorry, a friend of Jeff's was giving her, to date her. Life is going to give you another opportunity, but, but if you keep wallowing in your emotion rather than taking behavior and say, okay, I feel this way, that's interesting, what can I do now that's productive, that's healthy? And of course, it takes practice, right? It takes practice. It takes the little things, the little, little things you do that go, oh, let me take this small step that's a little healthy, just a little small step. But then you get into the habit of taking bigger and bigger steps. You feel dis disappointment, you feel fear, you feel anger, you feel whatever. Oh, what can I do now that's productive, that's beneficial to this situation? Right? Another quote. We are responsible for what we do no matter how we feel at the time. How often have you heard people use their feelings as an excuse for behaving irresponsibly? They might say, I didn't do the homework because I didn't feel like it. Especially those of you with kids or taking care of younger uh, children, you know how frustrating that can be. I didn't do the homework because I didn't feel like it. I couldn't ask her to have dinner with me because I'm shy. I shot him because I was angry. I won't eat because I'm resentful. I stayed in the house for months because of my grief. I can't drive on a freeway because I'm scared. Each of these statements contains two segments, one about the behavior and one about feelings. I can't, I won't, I don't, because I feel I felt, right? The goal is not to ignore or suppress feelings, no. To accept them as they happen to be at the moment, and then to get on with doing what is sensible and mature anyway. This is such a different perspective, end quote, by the way. This is such a different perspective from what we are usually taught in the West. We are so, you know, dramatic and it's all about going with the flow and feeling and, you know, all that stuff. And what's, the book makes an interesting point that when you're able to feel and accept your feelings but do what's mature and sensible anyway, you're actually able to feel more because... You know, you can feel anger without hurting someone. You can feel sadness without going into depression, right? You can truly feel as much as you want, but they just keep doing the things that are sensible and mature, and, of course, the feelings change to become more positive. So this is what I've, I've realized I've done in my life, and it's I'm really grateful for this perspective. So what about the third idea is what about people you feel negativity for? And the, the point from the book is do things that stimulate positive feelings for them. Uh, he shared a, um, 
a story about he was coaching a couple, and this couple were they they, they were they were married. They wanted they wanted to stay together. Uh, I mean, they of course they had been together for a while, and they still had some commitment to the relationship, but they were just complaining about each other, you know, each other's faults. And so he was consulting, con counseling both of them. And this is what he, this is the prescription he gave them. Quote from the book: "We start with a surprise present and a secret act of service each week. Ralph is to get something for Mabel, wrap it himself, and present it to her." We agree on an approximate weekly cost. He doesn't have to feel like buying it or even feel like giving it to her. He doesn't have to feel that she deserved it. Buying, wrapping, and giving are enough. Ralph is also instructed to do something for Mabel without letting her know that he did it. And the act of service must not benefit Ralph directly in any way. We agree on the amount of time he should invest in this service each week, say 15 to 30 minutes. It is most effective to perform this service when he is angry at Mabel, but any time is acceptable. Next, each evening, Ralph is to make a list of what Mabel did for him during the day and also the troubles he caused her. He is not to list what he did for her or the problems she caused him. Each week, we review Ralph's gift, service, and lists. We work on the means by which Ralph can present more thoughtful gifts, better service, and fewer problems for Mabel. Of course, Ralph initially wants to unload about Mabel's inadequacies, their fights, his fears about a breakup, and so forth. After a few minutes of listening, I try to make it clear that I care so much about these upsetting events that we had better get to work on solving them. And back we come to the gift, the service, and the lists. Can you see how these changes in behavior bring about the changes in Ralph in Ralph's attitude? Of course, over the week, over the weeks, Mabel is receiving the same instruction during individual sessions and carrying them out to Ralph's benefit. Essentially, then these are my suggestions for keeping a marriage or any relationship in good running condition. Each spouse gives a part of his or her life for the other. Acts of service deserve words of appreciation. In a healthy marriage and healthy relationship, the air is filled with communications of politeness and gratitude. What can I do for you now? What do you think about this? Do you know how important you are to me? Of course, there are times when we are tired, unconcerned, and wish to be alone. Even then, words of politeness, expressions of concern, and acts of service need to be need not be to be neglected. Behavior is behavior. Whatever we are feeling, our partners deserve the finest. Then the feelings come to align themselves with the thoughtful behavior. So I would say also, whatever we're feeling, the people in our lives deserve our finest. The people in our lives deserve the finest. Our friends, our family, our colleagues, even our enemies, quote unquote. They are in our lives for a particular reason. You know what the reason is? For us to learn how to love better. So for the people that you judge, that you feel bad that they did something or, or whatever. This is another quote from the book. Write a letter to someone you care about when you are feeling abandoned or isolated by them, or when you're feeling abandoned and isolated in general. The letter should contain nothing about your current sad state, nothing. It should, however, inquire about the other person's activities. It should mention your gratitude for specific things that the person has done for you. And it should contain an apology for specific things you have done or failed to do in keeping the relationship close. Isn't that nice? That's a, what a wonderful prescription to change your life to, and to change the relationship. When we serve others, unconditionally, especially when we don't feel served, the relationship improves. Our feelings improve. Right? 
So one more thing is, I mean, I um, when I feel like I'm judging someone, I pray for their well-being. I pray that they feel healthy, that they feel happy, that they feel loved today. Even if I think they're a bad person, I pray for their well-being, their happiness, that they feel loved today. And I also pray that they would accomplish their mission in this life with as much ease, th their highest mission in this life, with as much ease and happiness and gentleness as possible. So uh, I have some more to share, and I, I know I'm going to go over the half-hour mark today a bit. So those of you who are live might want to be cautious about the time. If you have something else to go to, those who are just listening, feel free to keep listening. I have some other great passages to share with you. And I want to um, also thank, uh, so I want to thank Vicky, Victoria, and I want to thank, thank Betsy for commenting actively on this episode as I'm recording it right now. I know, I know there are others watching and listening, and uh, maybe you're commenting elsewhere. Thank you as well. All right, so let's go on. So this is the um, uh, so so I've, I've shared a couple things thus far. Principles one is that feelings follow behavior, so you influence feelings to purposeful behavior. Secondly, rather than perseverating on a negative emotion, lose we can lose our self consciousness in the doing of life in service to the moment. And third. What do we do about people we feel negativity for? Well, do something that stimulates positive feelings for them. Acts of service, etc. Right? Prayer, etc. Okay, fourth. The fourth concept that I really got from the book was that life is a constant work of returning to doing what reality is presenting for us to do. In other words, as I said before, service to the moment. This way we don't become self-centered. I feel so sad that sometimes that Self-centeredness, looking out for number one, has become legitimized in our society, especially in the West, right? It's okay to be looking out for number one and, and, and always be asking, what's in it for me? I mean, as a marketing coach, you know, I, I used to teach people, remember, WIIF, whenever you're making an offer, think about WIIFM, what's in it for me? What's in it for the person? And yes, that's, I think marketing, we think about that. But... It's so unfortunate that we legitimize that. We think, oh, we should treat people, we should treat ourselves, everyone, as a selfish beings, and that's what we should assume and be. Well, if you keep thinking that way, that's what you will become more of, and that's what the people around you will become more of, because that's what you'll notice, and then that's what you'll behave subconsciously to elicit those that kind of lizard brain thinking and that kind of selfish behavior, right, et cetera, et cetera. No. We also, and recent science has proven this, we have an empath empathetic, cooperative spirit within us that we are perhaps essentially uh, wish to cooperate with others for the common well-being. But anyway, uh, wh whether or not that's true, I think it's good to legitimize generosity, legitimize selflessness rather than self -centered. legitimize service consciousness rather than self-centeredness. Okay, so a couple of wonderful quotes from this book that illustrates it so well. I was crossing the street with an acquaintance of mine one day when some papers flew out of a passing car. The car stopped and several students jumped out to collect the scattered sheets of paper. My impulse was to go run and help them. Traffic stopped, others rushed to their aid, but my acquaintance that I was walking with just kept on walking. If he noticed it at all, he didn't care about the papers. He was all wrapped up in himself. That fellow was perhaps the most miserable person I've ever known. He was so unsatisfied with his life, in fact, that he actually had made several serious attempts at killing himself. Pills, suffocation, even a gunshot wound near his heart. Some people would say that this young man needs to straighten out his thinking and feelings before he would be motivated to help those students pick up their flying papers. I don't think he has time to do that. More than 10 years of conventional therapy haven't helped appreciably. Furthermore, I don't think trying to straighten out feelings first is a sensible or even realistic course. My guess is that picking up the papers will help develop the other centeredness that my young friend needs. The doing changes 
the attitudes. The service alters the suffering self. I, I love that. The doing changes the attitudes. The service alters the suffering self. And he goes on to say that every moment, every situation, especially the hard ones in your life, pre pre presents you with an opportunity for self-growth and development of your character. Okay, okay so some more quotes, powerful quotes from the book. No one can guarantee pain-free living. No one can guarantee that success will follow our best effort. Our chances of success do improve as we behave responsibly, but sometimes we'll fail anyway. That's all right. Failure presents something for us to do just as success does. It's in responding to every moment's need, regardless of success or failure, that we mature. Sometimes, and just to pause for now on, on those quotes, sometimes I hear people say that life is about enjoyment, that life is about happiness. I think that's a distorted view, and I'll say, that, I'll say that life ultimately is about enjoyment, but it's about enjoyment in the longest term possible for the soul, for the spirit. Yes, life is about happiness in the longest term possible for the soul, and millions of years of enjoyment, right? Here on earth, in this third dimension, in this life that we've incarnated, incarnated into, life is about maturity. It's about growing up, not about enjoying ourselves. Again, except for spiritual joy, except for developing peace and true joy all the time, regardless of circumstances, right? So life is about growth more than about happiness in the way most people on earth think about it. Okay. So what happens when you feel discouraged? So quote from the book, simply note that you are discouraged and remember that being discouraged is a feeling. That's interesting, I'm discouraged. Already you have some distance from your discouragement. Next, resolve to accept the feeling as it is and not waste time struggling with it directly. Don't repeat. Don't take action in order to get rid of the discouragement. Take action to change what needs changing. Take action to respond to your situation. Let the discouragement take care of itself. Sometimes, no matter what you do, there is no immediate relief from the disappointment. In that case, you must simply accept the discouragement and go about your business. The feelings will pass. The sooner your attention shifts to responsible behavior, the sooner your feelings will fade. I should say the negative feelings will fade, and the sooner the positive feelings start bubbling up. The fully functioning human being isn't someone who is utterly free from pain and, and, and happy all the time. Not at all. The mature human being goes about doing what needs to be done regardless of whether that person feels great or terrible. Knowing you are that kind of person with that kind of self-control brings all the satisfaction and confidence you will ever need. Even on days when the satisfaction and confidence just aren't there, you can get the job done anyway. Okay, the final idea that I want to share with you from the book and the final couple of quotes the question that comes up for me is, great, this is, all, this is all wonderful in theory. How do we begin to actually institute constructive living into our lives? How do we do it? And this is what uh, David Reynolds says from the book. Begin a training period for yourself by doing simple activities. How you eat, how you move, exercise, and how you sleep. Eat move, sleep, okay? Then, after you get those three things stable and healthy in your life, you can then move on to other projects. But if you can't even get how well you eat regularly, what you eat, how well you move throughout the day, so that, by the way, I, I've been doing some uh, research. I, I actually want to mention um, that uh, 
recently I saw a comment from Julie Stiles in our in our online community. She was responding to episode three and how I talked about how it's great to be standing most of the day as you're working. And she said she did some more research into this, and she she learned from like some NASA studies, etc. That they found out it's actually not standing all day, but it's actually changing your relationship with gravity. This is from NASA. That's the greatest health. It's not always standing or always sitting. That's bad for you. It's not changing the relationship. So she said that it was it's better for human beings to sit, get up, or be on the floor, get up 15 to 35 times a day. And then I, I, I very synchronicitously, I had just recently um, saw this TED Talk called How to Live to Be 100 Plus by Dan Buettner. And I'll post the, the link to that TED Talk uh, in the show notes as well. And he was saying in his research of the longest living, healthiest people, healthy to the longest age possible, he noticed that one of the things they do, they, they move naturally. They don't even consciously exercise. Interesting, all right? They don't even have an exercise program. They just move a lot during their day. For, the, for example, the Okinawan elders uh, in Japan who live to 100 plus, health, healthily live to 100 plus, happily and healthily, they would get, sit on the ground and get up about 30 times a day, just naturally, just in their daily activities. They may be cooking, they may be preparing something, they may be helping their great, great, great grandkids or whatever. They, they sit on the ground and then they get up about 30 times a day. Or another group in, um, in Italy, Sardinia, they also live healthy to a long, long time. They often live in vertical houses, so they would climb up and down the stairs many times a day. So just for natural, not exercise program, but they just naturally move a lot during the day. So after, thank you, Julie Stiles, for that um, research and just the, the, I'm going to, instead of sitting and stand, standing all day long, I'm going to do more sitting, standing uh, uh, changes in, in movement. So anyway, that's the move part of it. But eat, move, sleep are the three things to stabilize and get healthy in your life if you want to live constructively and then you can move on to other <laughs> then, then you can constructively move on to other things. If you can't eat, move, sleep healthily, if you're not getting enough sleep, if you're not sleeping early enough to get enough sleep or whatever, forget it. I mean, because your emotions are going to be negative most of the time anyway because you're not getting enough sleep. No wonder, right? So this is from the book, Constructive Living. He, he writes this. For these clients, he's talking about people who just have a messed up life. He said, for these clients, it is necessary to begin restoring some order to their disarrayed lives. Beginning with simple activities, preparing three meals a day, instant, and I would say also uh, having healthy snacks two other times in the day. So three meals a day plus healthy snacks in the mid-morning and in the uh, afternoon is, is what I do. Preparing three meals a day instituting an exercise program and I would I would modify this to instituting how you move more during the day rather than just sitting all day or whatever ensuring thirdly ensuring sufficient hours in bed they must move towards regaining control over their behavior these patients are advised that sometimes they won't feel like exercising or preparing a meal Yet, they are to do these tasks anyway during this training period. Look at it as a training period. Okay? As the self-discipline of behavior progresses, bigger emotional roadblocks emerge. These impulses and moods also are to be accepted without struggle while the constructive action continues. Eating, exercise, sleeping are basic anchors of living. By the way, this book was written in 1984, okay? so before a lot of recent research on all this stuff. Many of the troubled people I know have neglected these fundamental aspects of daily life. A lot of moodiness, depression, nervousness, and even craziness improves when these simple needs are met in regular fashion. The book goes on to say, erratic, uncontrolled lifestyles produce erratic, uncontrolled people. Right? So, if you want to learn more about the habit creation aspect of all this, remember back in episode four, uh, ourhighestwork.com slash four, I talked about my, uh, my suggestions for how to create a new habit. So check that out. Okay, let me finish up uh, with just a few more quotes and then we'll, we'll end the episode. 
So um, David Reynolds, which is a you know accomplished psychotherapist, he says this. I'm much less interested in exploring your purposes, your motives, your reasons for doing something than having you focus on the reality of what you are doing. That is, the fact that for some reason you are doing whatever you're doing. Okay? The focus on doing is characteristic of, of constructive living. So rather than getting mixed up in a morass of motives, trying to analyze why am I watching this episode or listening to this right now or whatever, I want to zero in on the quality of this fact that you are listening right now. I want you to do the listening or the watching well. I'm paraphrasing from the book. Back to the book. That's the ultimate goal of constructive living, to help you do everything well with full attention. The more skill you develop in doing everything well, the more satisfaction and confidence you bring to your life. You practice living moment by moment with all your attention and you become skillful at living. That's the way to win in life, to become skillful at it. Put effort into doing even the most routine tasks as perfectly as possible. The way we form letters and numbers as we write, this is back in 1984, now we type all the time, but the way we type, but pay attention to it, the way we prepare an exquisite salad the most efficient movements, the most purposeful conversations, the most well-planned breaks, the most thoughtful acts of service. Every action should be carried out with awareness and full attention if possible. Of course, we all forget our resolutions sometimes and we drift into old patterns of mindless habit. Working hard and well takes years of concentration. But that's why we're here. That's why we're here, right? So whenever a negative feeling comes to you, remember this. Huh, that's interesting. I'm feeling anxious right now. Now, what do I do? That, what is one little thing I could do productively next that's healthy and productive? Huh, I'm feeling sad right now. Okay, that's interesting. What's one little productive, healthy thing I can do right now? Huh, I'm feeling angry right now. Huh, what's one little productive and loving thing I can do right now? Okay, huh. I'm feeling this negative thing. That's interesting. What's one little productive, positive, healthy thing I could do right now? So remember that little script. Okay, so um, I think I've shared enough. Um, I wish you a day forward with full attention, awareness of everything that you are doing, to do it with excellence, do it with gratitude, do it with mindfulness. And uh, may you begin to experience the joy very soon after you pay attention with mindfulness. I look forward to being with you in the next episode. And until then, be well.